I tell you what, it is just cold out today. But I'm not outside doing anything. Well, last video I teased this giant cardboard box and said we were going to open it and look see what's in it. And about two years ago, according to the shipping label on the box here, I was talking to a feller on the old Facebook about reloading presses and he said, you know, I've got this one out in my garage that I don't want anything to do with anymore. If you want to pay for shipping, I'll box it up and send it over to you. So, of course I said yes, I want it. I paid $18.90 in shipping and got myself another reloading press. So, let's open this up and see what we got here. I find my industrial safety shears here. Ha! Got him. Well, this is not going to work. Got it. Hang on. Perfect. Well, that worked well. Let's see what's in here. Mm -hmm, some paperwork. Ah, cool. And we got, ooh, that's always good. A Ziploc baggie full of parts that, uh, oh man, rats definitely pooped on those. And we got uh, a boomerang. Cool. Need a boomerang. And we got, oh. Oof -da. Huh. Yeah, gross. Yeah, we've got uh, 25 pounds of grease and dirt and mouse poop with a reloading press attached. Cool. So it's not going to be a surprise to any of you guys that actually read the thumbnail that what we have here is a green machine made by RCBS and uh, pretty good reason why I got it for free and why it's all covered in gunk and uh, we're going to talk about that in the second part of this video but uh, for the first one here I'm going to clean it up and show you how it functions and a couple of my thoughts on it. Be right back. All right, we got her all cleaned up. We're good to go. Oh, wrong thing. Be right back. <laughs> Whew. Now we're back. As you, thanks dog. I'm not trying to talk here or anything. As you can see, it cleaned up pretty decently. Ah, can't fool you guys. This is actually a completely different press. But this one was actually in much worse condition than the one I just pulled out of the box when I received it. And I'll toss some pictures kind of before and after and during the cleanup process at the end of the video here to show you how bad this guy was. So, you know, what's going on with these? Why is everybody giving them away and treating them so badly? Stay tuned for part two while I talk about that. So what we have here is a linear four station progressive reloading press and obviously this is called the green machine produced by RCBS and this only had a very brief run back in the early 80s I think they were produced from 1981 through 1985 ish so only about four year run and they weren't the first to come across uh, come up with a, a linear style reloading press. I actually have a couple others over here, the CH and the Cougar Hunter are two of them that predate this by quite a bit and there's some that are even much older than that. So they didn't, RCBS didn't come up with this design but they were kind of one of the real big names to offer this and like I said it only ran for a couple of years. 
Um, I know exactly how old this one was. Uh, this is pretty neat. Let me show you this real quick. So each one of these presses, from what I can tell, shipped in a box and was attached to a plywood base. And a lot of them, if you can find them with that base still attached, have a date written on them. And I don't know if those dates were written um, at the factory or if shops or people that, you know, consumers that bought them happened to, just a lot of people happened to date them, but a lot of them have a date on the plywood. And mine was dated 8, 9 of 82, which is pretty neat. I wish I would have been able to save the rest of the plywood here, but it was super duper bad condition when I got it. So there was really only one corner that wasn't just absolutely disgusting. So I cut that off and I saved that. This particular press I, I bought from a gentleman that was cleaning out his, I believe, father's garage. And unfortunately, this had been set in the back of a cabinet in the garage right next to a giant bucket of chlorine pool tablets and it was just completely covered in rust. Um, it took me oh about a month or so of, you know kind of occasionally tinkering on it to strip it down and completely clean it back up. I removed all the rust. I used a vapor rust solution, brushed everything off real good and then re-blued a lot of the parts so that's how it got to back to this condition here. It was actually missing the, missing the powder measure and the primer assembly when I got it and I added those. The only other thing that's missing from this press is there's actually a series of five clear plastic tubes that would attach to this case feed system and that would add a capacity of 80 total cases to this so you could run through one tube at a time and uh, effectively load 80 rounds without refilling the magazine uh, on here. Whether or not you could actually make it through 80 rounds is kind of debat debatable and I'll talk about those quirks later. This particular one is in uh, 38 Special or 357. You could do either one of those. They actually manufactured these presses to also load 9mm, uh, 44 mag and 44 Special and 45 ACP. I've heard that the original intent was to make one machine and then offer conversions. So you bought one machine and then you could swap them out to those you know, four different calibers if you wanted to. But it turned out that that was such a pain to do the conversion that um, it, it didn't work well at all. So they just sold machines separate for each caliber. Uh, whether or not that's 100% true, I don't know, but I do know that you can't find any caliber conversion kits for these. You can find pieces to replace every once in a while, but there's no, no actual conversions available for them. Uh, every once in a while, somebody will find one of these and ask about, hey, where do I, you know, find this this part or that other part? And um, well, unfortunately, RCBS no longer supports these, and you can find replacement dies, the, the depriming and resizing die, the uh, crimp die, and you can find the little dandy powder measure, and that's really only thing that's available from RCBS for this press. So we'll talk about why in part two. So again, a plug, you gotta watch part two. So. I actually do have this one fairly well set up. I'm not going to run any powder or primers through it, um, but I'm going to get you in here a little bit closer and show you kind of the overall function of the press and run a cartridge through it. So what I'm going to do here is I've got the press bolted down to my, well, quick gripped down to my bench here, and I'm going to run a casing through this operation and show you kind of how each stage works. Again, I don't have any powder set up in here and I don't have any primers and so we'll just load a dummy around here. But you'll get the idea of how this, how this thing works. So this is the case feed system here. Originally there would have been plastic tubes attached to this and you'd load them up high and they'd shoot down here. You could actually take this off here. There's a little ball detent and it sets down on there and indexes on that. Since I don't have the tubes, I can just load them in here a couple at a time. So if I drop one down, I'm going to start the handle in the upright position. 
Now, here's something that I'm going to forget to do later on, but I want to start with the powder measure disengage. So there's two little pins on the back of here. I'm going to pull those out so it doesn't activate the powder measure. And uh, we'll talk about that in the next video, but that's a, a quirk of this that's really kind of a, a pain. So if I cycle the handle down once, note of the, notice the powder measure here, it doesn't cycle this cylinder, um, doesn't turn, so I wouldn't be dumping any powder there. Cycle it once, it's going to transfer the case over to position number one. And how it does that is there's a, an actuator on the side here with a cam lobe um, that pushes the transfer bar over and each station has a little pawl with a it's spring loaded. And so the first position here is D prime and resize. So I don't have a, a priming rod in this die. I actually broke it off on this press and just haven't gotten around to replace it. But there's a hole in the transfer bar under station one and underneath that hole there is a little bottle screwed in the bottom that would capture your used primers. So I'm not going to put that back in there because I'm not going to be able to punch a primer out. So if I cycle the handle the next time, bring the tool head down and it's going to size that case. Pull it back up. It's going to advance to station number two. Now station two on the upstroke it transfers a primer from the primer mechanism through the plate and pushes up in the bottom. There's a little punch that pushes the new primer up in there on the upstroke. Now I would have to reactivate my powder measure by pushing my pins in. This powder measure is not case activated, so whether or not you have a case in there, when you cycle the handle, if the pins are engaged on the back of here, it's going to dump powder. So again, there's a quirk that uh, kind of makes this a little bit more complicated and leads to some errors. So, cycle the handle down. It's going to engage the powder measure. Notice it's going to rotate here halfway and then engages the second pin, rotates all the rest of the way as I size it down. I'm sizing. So that would have dumped the powder. I'm sorry, not sizing, I'm flaring the case. And so that would have dumped the powder. And if you watch here, this bar activated the wheel on the the case on the primer feed mechanism, which would have dropped another primer down into the transfer bar. And I pull it up, just the spring nature of this makes it hop back the case. Oh boy, look at that, we got that lined up really nice. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pull that out of there and show you that little fine howdy do. We did a number there. So, already we're off to a great start on how well the green machine works. Well, I've got that pulled out of there. I'm going to cycle this again just to show you how the powder measure activates and how we transfer a primer. So if you can see down in here, there's a hole in station two in the transfer bar that see the primer seat stem popping out of there as I engage the handle. As I bring the handle down, the bar hops back, the case would be captured in these little grooves in the plate here. Coming down, the powder measure is being activated, it's turning, so it's now charged the bar, and on the next half turn it would dump it in the case. The spring hits the this wheel on the primer feed mechanism, turns it, that would capture another primer and drop the next one down into the transfer bar. Now that I'm all the way at the bottom, it would dump the powder, there's a flaring stem inside of here. And so we'd flare the case, drop the powder, transfer the next primer over, transfer the primer there. And then as I bring the handle up, we're gonna cycle the powder measure back into position. We have now transferred a new primer over. The next case has come over and we'd be pushing the new primer into the bottom of the next case. Let me track down another piece of brass and we'll see if we can get to uh, stations three and four. So I dug in my spare parts and found the expander die powder funnel. So this actually would set inside of this die. Powder would be dropped through the middle of there 
into the case and then there's a little bit of a shoulder that expands the case as you bring it down I'm not sure what we caught up on on the last time maybe that groove in there maybe that brass is bungled up a little bit i don't know so we're going to try that one more time so I'll bring the handle down a little bit drop my case in there and i can actually manually activate this transfer bar just by pushing over here so into station one station two we're going to try this again see if it mangles it again i don't have much resistance there so i think that one worked out all right so we would have dropped our powder transferred our primer for the next casing upstroke it's going to transfer to station three this is our bullet seating station and this is one of the really cool parts about the green machine is that we have a cutout die here with a little sleeve that rides in there and a push rod on the top that's activated by this linkage on the side. So I don't place my bullet down in here. I can actually drop my bullet right in there and there's a little spring clip in there that holds the bullet from dropping all the way through. So I feed my bullet into the window. So on this action, we would bring down, you can see the seating rod coming down. It's going to contact that bullet and start seating it into the case. So there it's pushed all the way down to its limit, seated in the case. The seating depth would be adjusted by moving this die and the, the position of the seating rod in here. Actually, and in combination with this linkage on the side here, this piece would thread in and out. So it's kind of a complicated mess to get your seating die set up. Cycle the handle back up. We've seated our bullet in there. It's now advanced to station four, which is our crimp die. So we are going to bring the handle down one more time. And we're gonna crimp that bullet in there. Handle back up. And we're gonna kick it out as a finished round. Maybe, I just sit there. But there is the process to load a 38 Special on the green machine. Now, if you're observant, you would have noticed that while I was talking and explaining this, I completely forgot to deactivate the powder measure system. So had I actually been loading that, I would have dumped a whole charge of powder out onto the transfer bar and the case rails and created a giant mess. So you definitely have to have your wits about you operating this. There's a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of user interaction that has to happen to make this thing operate smoothly. As you can see, I had a mess up just in trying to demonstrate it, and that's kind of been my experience with this. Uh, I've actually loaded a few rounds on this, and I can't get more than half a dozen cycled through before I have a giant mess on my hands. I know some people just have them up and running flawless, and I think I probably could get this one dialed in too if I just had a little bit more determination and I was actually intending to use it to reload, and I don't. It's kind of just a shelf piece at this point. One of the interesting things about these green machines is that each one of them is individually serialized, and if you haven't, your press hasn't had this little plate fall off of it yet, you can tell uh, exactly what serial number it is. And these are both in 38 Special or 357, and this one's in the 5000 uh, series serial number, and this one's in the 3000 series. So obviously there are many, many thousand of these built. They're not exactly rare, but you don't see them very often in people's reloading setups. Um, it's very, very rare to actually have come across somebody that has this in their day-to-day -day operation and of course these are coming up on 40 years old now so that could be part of it but I think from what I can tell and what I've read that even maybe 30 years ago you would have had a hard time finding people that still uh, were dedicated to their green machines and there's a handful of reasons why that is and we're going to talk about that in part two of this so Thanks for watching kind of the overview on the green machine. Come back and watch part two as, as soon as I get that pulled together and we'll talk about all the interesting little quirks. Again, thanks for watching, sure appreciate it.
So when you advance to the third stage, oh my word, dog, you stink. <laughs> 